Hello, hello, and welcome back to Trying to Figure It Out. This week, I am joined by the queen of getting banned. She is a content creator, a mental health advocate, and I'm so excited for our conversation today. Welcome to Trying to Figure It Out, Christy Howard. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. I'm excited that you're here. I saw that you recently cut your hair or took out your hair extensions, and there's been some comments on it on social media. Okay, what? Like, people are so mean. People suck. They don't like my hair. They're going to find something not to like always. But when I put the extensions in, they didn't like it either. You can't win. There's no no winning. So don't do what they want. Do what you want. And I tried to make a video clapping back last night and it got taken down for harassment and bullying. Why? Do they say why? Just that. It was saying that. I don't, I don't know. But I was like, how is that fair that they can comment that? They can say back? the meanest shit ever. And yeah. then your video is going to be deleted. I when think you're it's because like whenever I do that, then my followers will gang up on that on one that person, person, which like, even if I made a video saying that's not what I want y'all to do, like it's still like setting it up for that. Yeah. So that's fair. That yeah. That's fair. Well, I think your hair looks great <laughs> and I love it. And I honestly change my hair like every other week. Like I feel like people don't recognize me like even my friends I'll show up one week to a party and then they won't see me for a couple weeks and then I have a new hair color and like I always look different it's like so. fun it's a different yeah. identity <laughs> I love it I saw that you had pink hair yeah. once too I did somebody as well. yesterday literally messaged me and they were like bestie we need to update the profile picture <laughs> and I was like well now that you say that I really never do but I kind of like it because it makes it look like I have like mystery like yeah <laughs> I was like, like wait so her hair is not pink no it <laughs> hasn't been for like two years but still I'm just like well, I'm lazy, but I'm, yeah, I'm like, maybe it makes me look cool. I love it. <laughs> okay, so you are in L.A. You're not from L.A. Can you tell me mm-hmm. what you're in L.A. for and how your trip has been so far? I came for an event, and then I'm just kind of, like, making the most out of it while I'm here. So I'm like, let's do whatever, do all the things, mm-hmm. because in the past, I've always, you know, said no to everything. And so I'm kind of trying to make this, like, my yes year. Yeah, I and, like, that. get out of my comfort zone, because a lot of stuff is, like, in my head. Like, I went to an event two nights ago and I went by myself Mm -hmm. not knowing a single person there or anyone who was gonna go or anything which is something like it seems so small but I would have never done that like in my opinion I'm just like I'd rather stay home whatever but I'm trying to take up on opportunities and I feel like I have such like I'm in such a cool space Mm -hmm. and I just like rot in my bed all the time and make videos like I need to like (laughs) network and go out and meet people and so I'm just trying to do that but yeah that was the first time I went to anything like that alone and I like took a lap and was about to leave and then I like walked up to a table and literally just like there was like two girls standing and I just was like what's the tea and then they're like oh my gosh hi and they were so outgoing and I literally just became best friends with them and I'm like wait hello why don't I do this back in Nashville like I felt like maybe it's because I don't live here so I was like nobody knows me like I'm not embarrassed yeah but yeah I'm like wait I think I could do this more often for sure (laughs) so yeah no I feel that the social anxiety is real and it's honestly interesting because I feel like a lot of people would have the opposite experience like maybe in a place like Nashville or like other places LA is so intense like the people are very intense those events can be like super overwhelming and probably like nerve-wracking to go to you're like who do I talk to feel like I don't know I'd be like comparing myself to other people like all these different thoughts in my head and so it's interesting that like you came here and were able to like really put yourself out there I think that's amazing I know I'm proud of myself which is big (laughs) and also I like was asking the girls they were like we saw you when you walked in and like we were like oh my gosh her jacket's so cute and I was like wait did I look like did I look like a loser though and they're like no like you looked like you like we would have never guessed you were her alone you look like you knew what you're doing I was like oh yes it's working just You know, kept my head down. <laughs> no, literally, though. Honestly, I it's so interesting because people who put themselves out there and make content, like, usually are the people that are the most nervous in a social situation. Yes. So it's, like, funny because people probably think that you have, like, the most confidence in a room and, like, walk into any space and you're not thinking, like, who do I talk to? Who do I hang out with? But it's – people don't really know what people are actually going through. And I'll overanalyze, like, every single thing. Oh, for sure. And try and like play out out. before I even go, like play out the scenario of what I think is going to happen. Fully. So you grew up in Georgia and now you live in Nashville. Mm -hmm. So you're a Southern girl. How do you like LA in general? Like, do you think you could ever see yourself living here? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I definitely have fun every time I'm here and I love the food. Um, So good. But I'd have to be really, maybe it's just in my head. I'd have to be really (laughs) people-y. Yeah. And I don't know, I like... Like, even Nashville is very similar to Georgia, so Mm -hmm. I feel like it's the same, you know, we have the same stores, the same, like, culture type, all of that. I like the green, like, it's a city, but you can still, 10 minutes away, be, like, in the outskirts. I love that. There's, like, I don't know, just, like, a lot 
going on here? <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> I like it's visiting. <laughs> no, yeah, it's a lot. Honestly, it's funny because I feel like you said that you come here and you're like putting yourself out there more. What do you do? Like what's a typical week for you in Nashville in terms of like going out, meeting people and going to events? Not going. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mood. <laughs> no, but I get invited to like the coolest stuff. Like even just like I get more excited for restaurant openings. Oh, then, yeah. You know that I could just go and like get a free meal and like yeah. mingle a little bit. But when like brands come and do these huge things, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a brand like I've always used and I would love. Mm-hmm. I'm so excited. And then the day of it, like literally day of, I back out of everything all the time. I really relate it, to that. I hate how that makes me look and I just hate doing it. I'll get all ready and just, I can't go. Like I just back out and then I'll like in my head, I'll be like, well, I didn't really know anyone going anyway. So, mm-hmm. you know, and I'll like watch the Instagram story of the brand over and over, like updating them, setting up the event and yeah. stuff. And I'm like, you know what? It doesn't look like something I'd be comfortable at. So I just never go. And I'm trying to get over that. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, you're super open about having anxiety. When did you start to notice that this was something you struggled with? I guess mainly probably when I moved away for college. Um, I went to U of A, which was like complete opposite. Like no yeah. one where I'm from went to even like California, Arizona. Yeah. Um, everyone kind of like stays in the South. When I was there, I guess I was really struggling, like being away from home and my family and stuff like that. And that's basically where it hit me when I first started having like panics and stuff like that and Mm. didn't really know what it was or why I think it was more than just me being depressed in college I think there was things where I I just stopped going to class and wanting to not because I didn't like it like I wanted to go but Mm -hmm. if I was like which I've seen people talk about this I think this is really relatable like people are like when you're one minute late to a college class like and you just turn around because it's worse than walking in yeah and so I just would do stuff like that all the time where I just would never end up going and like making them I never wanted to go to any I wasn't in a sorority and they were very Greek life Mm -hmm. so I didn't want to go to like any of the stuff because I just felt like I didn't know anyone and I don't know I think that's when like a lot of things started to hit me but yeah then it kind of like just got worse I came home and my anxiety just kind of like looked like different things like it was when I was in a relationship and I would get these you know impending doom feelings all the time about things and (laughs) so real (laughs) and that's when I like was actually diagnosed with panic disorder when I didn't know what it was that I was having like I literally thought I was having heart attacks all the time it's horrible you know I did only there was only once when I actually went to the hospital and then that's when they were like you're just having a panic attack and I was like like in the movies like oh my gosh am I dramatic because I literally am the type that if I'm sick I'm not gonna go to the doctor like I will put it off which is so irresponsible but because I'm lazy but also because I'm just like there's no point like I don't want to be I don't want the drama yeah. But yeah. <laughs> well, I have panic disorder too, so oh, really? I can relate. And I had my first panic attack in college as well. And I had no idea what was happening. I was driving on the freeway. He- I went to college here. So I moved to LA from New York, came here and I was like so excited to experience the world and had never, I had went to the same school from kindergarten to 12th grade, never was the new kid anywhere, never went to summer camp, like never had any other place where I needed to make friends. Like I yeah. never was the new person anywhere. That's crazy. And then I came out here to go to USC and I had always struggled with anxiety when I was a kid, but I was never able to like put a finger on what it was. And then when I came out here for college, there was one day where I was driving on the freeway and literally out of, like there was nothing on my mind and out of nowhere, I felt like the road was like swerving, like everything started like looking weird to me. And then my heart just started aggressively racing. I was like, oh my God, I'm either having like a stroke or like about to have a seizure or I'm having a heart attack. Like, I don't know what's happening. I had to pull over and just like sit in my car and I was panicking, like it was so bad. And then it was after that, that I called my stepdad who's a doctor and I was like, what the fuck is happening to me right now? Like, I think I need to go to the hospital. And he's like, you're having a panic attack. And I was like, but why? Like nothing's even wrong. Like, what do I do? And he was like, you need to like see a doctor and figure out like what you can do, like either get Xanax or like whatever it is, like you need something. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. well, and from that point on, I've had them, it like became like a weekly, once I had the first one, like the floodgates opened. I don't know if you can relate to that. No. Yeah. It was like a time period of them. And luckily like I haven't had one in a very long time, Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm still always living on edge. Yeah. You're like like, afraid. I never knew what would trigger it. And I never Mm -hmm. knew when I could kind of start telling when one was coming. And my only advice would be like to kind of exit that situation or environment. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I just like didn't, I don't know. They're scary. And even you talking about it, it was like making my heart. No, it's giving you anxiety. Oh my gosh, that feeling. (laughs) I haven't felt that in so long. (laughs) Have you ever had a panic attack at Disney? Because 
Oh, that has happened to me that before. That sounds <laughs> and it miserable. Was horrible. Like, literally, I'm not, like, worst place on earth to have a panic attack. What? <laughs> worst <laughs> place on earth to have a panic attack. Not like the characters in in the big costume. I'd be like, just oh, every sound me. of like a kid <laughs> yeah, yelling. It is. It's like it's sounds. Like every, you're like in a you dream. Hypersensitive to you. Like, I feel like you're like fucked up. Oh no, it's you're crazy. not. <laughs> and I always say like when I have a panic attack, like at night, the next morning I wake up and I almost feel like hungover. Like it like hits me the next day. Like I have like aftermath. Yeah, of it. it's crazy. How do you manage your anxiety now? Like, do you have? medication that you take do you have like a, any rituals that work for you what is like your go-to methods yeah I take medication um it took like you know a couple years of finding like they put me on what everybody else in my family was on mm-hmm. and I was like why does it work for them and not me and then I realized like you know they don't have the same kind of anxiety as me and also mm-hmm. it doesn't work for every single person so everything people were recommending me like ask your doctor about this I'm like mm-hmm. okay that doesn't work for me yeah. but um I finally found something that you know, works. So I've been on that for a while. I've been in and out of therapy. I see a psychiatrist and I kind of know my triggers, which sometimes they can be people. Sometimes they can be places and environments. And so I just kind of am like very cautious around things. And I try and push myself like to go to events and stuff, but I try not to push it too hard. Yeah. Like I don't want to do too too much and overdo it where it's gonna ruin everything for me 100 <laughs> percent. I always say like this is like the corniest most cliche advice you could ever give but like my advice to anyone who's struggling with anxiety or like having a hard time motivating themselves like don't be too hard on yourself like truly do what works for you and if staying in bed is what works for you in that moment like mm-hmm. obviously <laughs> push yourself when you can and sometimes it's good to get out of your comfort zone but if you need a moment like take the moment like it's yeah. okay like we have a long life ahead of us, you know, I know, like hopefully like, I think the like worst part of it though, is the anxiety of people not who don't have it judging you or yep. like canceling on plans and stuff and it oh, looking yeah. weird because people, I mean, yes, of course people can understand you have anxiety, but sometimes they don't really understand the depth of it. And you're like, no, I'm not like canceling just because I don't want to go. Like I literally will throw up. Like, yeah, like you're not understanding. I will see stars. And like, no. I don't want y'all to think I'm super weird because I'm not having a good day today. <laughs> no, honestly, I think this is like an important subject because I have a lot of friends in my life that I feel like I'm letting down a lot or like they always give me shit. They're like, I'll believe it when I see it if we're actually hanging out this time. I get time. that stuff all the time. And I'm like, it makes me feel bad because I understand from their perspective, like how it must feel like they're just wanting to hang out and not like all my friends understand mental health and they're super, you know, self-aware. I really don't make plans unless I like really know I can stick to them. Like I try really hard not to fill up my weeks because if I do, (laughs) I just spend the whole week being anxious about like being locked into something that I don't know if that day, like, will I be feeling up for it? I Mm -hmm. don't know. Like I literally won't know until that day. No, same. And I'll like think about that one thing that I have planned up until it comes every like day. it's the only thing I can like yeah, revolve like, every day around Saturday and I have to do this and I'm like I hate that feeling like I don't I have enough stress and anxiety already like to then yeah. add a plan that's gonna be like lingering over my head like I just don't have the space for that like I don't want to be thinking about I don't I don't want the stress yeah. 100% <laughs> oh it's the worst okay so I for my listeners do want to just like preface this part of the conversation with a trigger warning and just if this is not a topic that you are comfortable listening to you can skip along or listen if you are interested we are going to talk a bit about addiction so growing up we were talking a lot about social situations and how they can be really uncomfortable and you've Mm -hmm. been open about how growing up your sister was a big part of making you feel comfortable in social Mm -hmm. situations can you tell me a little bit about Kat and how she was a role model for you and someone that made you feel comfortable in situations? Yeah. Um, so she was just always super outgoing and we had to, we always lived in the same house, but we moved schools a lot because of her (laughs) and I would just go along with it. And I felt like I was more quiet and stuff like that. Um, but she was just, you know, everybody, like everybody knew her, Mm -hmm. like she was like coward. And I was just like her little sister and she kind of would, you know, introduce, we moved to a new school and she had like a million friends in the first day. Yeah. I maybe talked to one person the whole time I was there, like the whole whatever. And then just even when we'd go to like car riders and stuff like that, like she'd have like all the people around her and Mm -hmm. I'd be like, this is my sister. And I'd just be, let me stand with her. But like, I didn't actually have any like (laughs) friends there or anything. And so I guess I always just like leaned on her for stuff like that. And so then now that 
she's not here. I guess I'm just kind of use that as an excuse. And I'm like, wait, where's my friend? Like, where yeah. is it? Who's going <laughs> to yeah. be all outgoing and stuff like that? So I'm like learning to put myself out there more without her. But um, yeah. Obviously, a lot changed in your life when Kat turned 14. Can you mm-hmm. talk a little bit about her story and, you know, what started to happen when she was 14? She, you know, always was super popular. So she dated guys <laughs> a lot older. And um, she also looked like she was like 30 when she was 14. Um, so I guess it was just a, a boyfriend of hers at the time who was like 18 and she was 14. And I guess he just got her into, you know, drugs and stuff. And it they just kind of progressed. I don't remember really like knowing what all it was that she was doing at 14. Right. But I just know that she was always in and out of like special schools, um, just like anything to keep her... Yeah, (laughs) circle small and secluded secluded. and stuff like that and you know it got worse so she would just always be in and out of these things over the summer these like rehabs and detox centers and stuff like that and we would go and visit her sometimes but I think that I never really understood how serious it was I mean I did but also none of my friends as we got older it was more known but nobody at that age because we were 14 months apart so when mm-hmm. she was 14 I was 13 years old like right. nobody my age had siblings that age too yeah. that were that deep in addiction which is so crazy and it's just I don't know I feel so sad for her because at 14 like your brain like who I, I don't even know <laughs> remember who I was at 14 yeah I don't remember being just 14. To, like try something because of who you're dating and then like as she got older, she was like, my body hurts. Like I crave these things. I, and she was so embarrassed of it. And like, Mm -hmm. wouldn't, if I ever walked in on her with something out in her room, she would cry and say, I'm so sorry you saw that. Please do you hate me? I'm like, no, just don't do it. And she's like, okay, I promise I won't. I promise. Just please don't tell mom. Like, okay. And it was always like me trying to act like I was like annoyed or mad. Cause I'd be like, okay, that's just weird. Like, why do you do that? We don't even know anybody who does that stuff. Like you realize that. Right. And I was so mean because I felt like I had to be because it, I was like her one soft spot that she'd be like, oh, like if she saw that I got mad at her, she'd like put it down or whatever. But yeah, basically she just got into stuff really young and it was just kind of back and forth. Just 10 years of like in and out of places nonstop. Like it never stopped. And even when she was really good and she'd have a good job two months later, it was just always like scary. So that's kind of why I went off to college so far away because I was like, I just can't be here and always be worrying. Like I want to be far and then she came <laughs> I stopped going to class and she like got a plane ticket and came and like lived with me at college oh wow for like three months and like wasn't doing anything just staying but yeah and so I had her there with me like that safe space and I stopped going to class which is so bad but we just kind of like lived together in Arizona and she was like I don't want to yeah. go home Christy I don't want to go home because then I'm gonna have to work <laughs> which is so bad. I'm gonna <laughs> she would just stay with I mean, me in my dorm it's, it's real and like That's I'd or nice. I'd use my meal plan and stuff and just get us food like all the time mm-hmm. she's like and then mom and dad are gonna harass me and make me work and then I'm gonna get back into you know I can't be surrounded by the people back at home because right. I'll get back into all that stuff but my parents were so scared about sending her to another state so yeah. they never would they always would keep her in state and the one time they sent her out of state was when she passed which is so crazy for like a facility or for or a, to a detox center yeah. like they always kept her like in Georgia mm-hmm. and then that was the one time where they were like nothing's working here it's you know it's been 10 years whatever yeah and she found that place and so then but that's just so crazy I'm like like my mom's mother's intuition she knew like I knew I needed her close yeah I knew it's like you always saying, know but you don't know why it's like yeah. just that feeling yeah I think it's like really important in this part of the conversation to just like really you know stress like everything you're saying addiction is like so truly a disease like even you saying that like every time you would walk in on her doing something she would immediately want to like hide it or put it away and like it really impacted her when you would see that and I think that like what people lose a lot is like that empathy or understanding that like it is a true disease. Like people Mm -hmm. are in pain, like they are struggling. Like it's not just as simple as like, don't do it. And just thinking back, I remember she in her apartment, she had sticky notes everywhere. Like she would handwrite them and I make fun of her for them. Cause I'm like, these are so lame. And there, she would put them on her mirror and everywhere she went, that would be like, don't like stay sober, build your relationship with Christy. Like, Mm -hmm. write all these things that she could lose because she had to look at them because that's how hard it was. It wasn't like she did. She wanted to go out and party. It was like she woke up 
And the only thing that like puts me at semi ease is that like one of the last things I remember her telling me was like when she was crying to me and you know about we were kind of fighting a little bit and she was saying, I don't think there will ever be a day in my life where I just wake up and I'm not fighting. Like I hurt every day, even if I'm a couple days mm-hmm. without using, I am in so much pain that I don't know what the word is, but they, she had some shot she would get in her spine that would help her mm-hmm. uh, detox. Whereas like if she did use on that, it would make her like very, very sick. She's like, even when I'm on that, like I'm, it sucks. Mm-hmm. I, I fight every day and this is my life. This is the rest of my life. And she's like, I'm in hell. I'm miserable. Yeah. And I'm going to keep trying, but like. I hurt so bad and it was just sad because I'm like I don't know what to do yeah I don't know what what are you supposed to do yeah what was like the turning point where you noticed that it was like transitioning into you know a way more serious addiction um probably this is so crazy we moved to schools again and it was our first we always went to private school so this was like a public school football game which was like Mm -hmm. big to us we didn't do that out where we were before for everyone listening we let my dogs out because they were not behaving so the dogs are out you're gonna be hearing breathing sounds and whatever not so sorry in advance to anyone listening okay back to this you were telling me when you first noticed that she was Mm -hmm. using harder drugs yeah so at a football game at our new school we were in middle school she was in seventh grade I was in no, I was in seventh. She was in eighth. Mm-hmm. And she was in the bathroom and I had some girls come out, out to me and they were like, your sister's not okay. She needs you in the bathroom stall. And in my head, I'm like, oh, you know, I probably assumed she was fucked up. So I go into the bathroom and there's all these like older women around mm-hmm. and they're like, who is, who's with this girl? Who's with this girl? And she's like in the bathroom floor and she was overdosing. And I'd never seen with like, seen that happen to her or to anyone mm-hmm. or anything I'm in seventh grade I don't yeah. know what to do she's like just asking for me whatever we call the ambulance the it was like the whole football game we were new to the school that's what my first impression there yeah. was or everybody on me I guess the ambulance came my parents came they took her to the hospital and I went with them or whatever and then that's just kind of in that moment was where I was like whoa <laughs> yeah that was yeah, still thing, which I don't think anybody at that school had like seen that happen. No, or, I don't like, think at, like, we were that's in middle school, in like, we were traumatized. Yeah. yeah, and I still just like remember her sitting there in the bathroom, and she like couldn't, like she wasn't looking, she was looking up, and like mm-hmm. couldn't, and like just people in the restroom were freaking out, and it was in public, and it, it was scary. And so I just like didn't go. The next day I had a cheer competition because I did all star cheer, and mm-hmm. that was kind of my way to like get out of the house. Yeah. And the next day I had a cheer competition, and neither of my parents could come or anything, and um obviously everybody was like gossiping about why and stuff but I just remember like having to like do stuff like that alone at those points yeah and that's just kind of when it all started to hit me like oh this is a thing yeah and then people started not being able to I'd start making friends and people wouldn't be able to hang out with me because yeah my sister Their parents were yeah or like literally the dumbest stuff ever and I didn't understand why and I'm like that which I still am like ew that yeah. rubs me such the wrong way of because course. like if you didn't know that, you would have never known that she was in a, like an addict. Like yeah. so many people, even that I was so close with when she passed, like they knew she was always in and out of like things. They probably thought for like behavioral issues, right? But like she did not give like off the stereotypical like addict. Yeah, and yeah. In, in which there isn't really one, but people paint a picture of it. Of course. And like she just was so chill and cool and normal and like popular girly. Like, yeah. It just yeah what was it like at home in terms of like your parents and your family dynamic and what was it looking like in your household when she was really you know going through it the most um well my parents are like so great like I have a great relationship with my parents she had a great relationship with my parents I always say it's like so shocking I feel like that they're still together Mm because I feel like that's rare in general and like with all the stuff they've dealt with there was always like you know one sorry one parent that you know would feel want to give in to her and like feel bad and Mm -hmm. I feel like there's one you know my dad she would tell a little more to where my mom would like put her foot down more but really was I don't know just stuff like that back and forth I remember like you know whenever I had friends over my mom always telling me to lock my door and tell my friends which would embarrass me she'd be like make sure y'all lock your car doors not because of where we live but because if in case my sister like went through their car which in my head, I'm like, ew, like, why would you be a thief? Like, ew, yeah. that makes no sense. And then sometimes she'd be like, I don't even remember doing that. Yeah. And I'm like that. And she'd be like too embarrassed. Like, can you please 
like when she took my iPad and pawned it. Mm. I was like, oh my Justin Bieber videos. Like, I don't even care that. And like stuff like that. And then she's like, I don't even remember doing that. And I promise I'll get a job and I'll pay you back for it. And then yeah. like the next day she's like, I don't remember that conversation. Like stuff like that. So it was just kind of like always, there was, you know, stuff like that. But amidst all that, I still feel like we had such a good childhood. We had such a good home. Like we were very privileged growing up and you know, my parents were able to afford to put her in all these places where I feel like normally a lot of people would just be on the streets, right? Like she was never on the street. She was always had a bed somewhere, always had, mm -hmm. you know, they would have, you know, put any amount of money into getting her help, of course, which is something that I never am going to like not, which is why I think she, you know, at least made it to 24, which I know might not be such a positive way to look, but no, I, I truly do is. believe that helped them always being able to like get her help or not Absolutely. everybody has that opportunity because things are so pricey and crazy and yeah and people I also, say they want to help and then they're like but what's does your we don't take your insurance everybody's situation is different mm -hmm. and you know my parents always wanted the best but there was no right or wrong thing like we it's like I grew up only being able to get gift cards I could never have cash right. because she could never have cash for anything so I just have shit tons of gift cards everywhere still to this day that I don't know what to do with because I just forget I have them yeah um and just like little things like that and yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel any resentment like parts of your childhood were taken away? And like you, like I'm saying this in a way that isn't to make you sound like a bad sister like mm -hmm. or anything like that. But I think it's important to understand that like the people in the household are also going through something. And, you know, part of your childhood is taken away because there's so much focus on her and making sure she was OK and trying to help her as much as possible. So do you feel like, you know, certain things were taken away from you or that you missed out on certain things and felt resentment? I think at the time, probably like how, you know, when nobody could come to my cheer competitions and like little things like that, I'm always moving new schools mm -hmm. because I couldn't make friends as easy as her. And I'd be like, just picked up one day and be like, wait, why are we leaving? Do I get to say bye to anyone? Yeah. And, like not really knowing what's happening, stuff like that at the time. But now looking back, like, no, I'm not, I don't really, you know, mind any of that. I feel like if anything, it taught me to branch out more and stuff like yeah. that. So I am thankful. I always did cheer. That was like, I would be on like three teams and a dance team. So I was gone all day long, like right after school from like two to 9 30 PM yeah. and then would be home. So I just always was busy. And then that made me very social because every weekend would be cheer comps and friends and stuff. So I feel like if anything, I'd feel more like regret for when I was older, not really like my childhood, but when mm -hmm. I was older and I feel like just me kind of like, that's when I, got fed up and I would just be like I'm doing my own thing like I'm getting my own place I don't know what you do like you go fix yourself I can't like that's where I have like resentment not so much when I was like younger but like the most recent times and stuff like that right so amidst all of this you ended up moving to Nashville mm -hmm. which is where you live now and right when you moved there you got a phone call from your dad that your sister had passed mm -hmm. can you tell me a little bit about what that phone call was and you know, was there any part of you that saw it coming or, you know, how were you feeling in that moment? Um, I definitely didn't see it coming. You know, you always expect that phone call, but you just don't think it's like going to happen to you yeah. at all ever. Mm -hmm. Especially I was like, it just, I don't know. I didn't feel it at all. Um, I'd been there for five days and it was like at 11 AM and I was in the best mood ever. And you know, my dad called me and I pulled over and then my mom was on the phone with him too and like they didn't even have to say it like but just the fact that they were together because he works all day and never would call me during the day but she wasn't like I mean I knew she was in a detox place but she wasn't in something really serious the last I talked to her mm -hmm. which was the night before she, everything was fine um she well she just seemed a little off but we were just texting I don't know I didn't put two and two together mm -hmm. so yeah that uh was like the worst thing of my entire life that phone call um, of course I pulled over and then I just had to find a way to Atlanta on my own and I like was frozen I couldn't pack I couldn't which I didn't pack I just ordered stuff to wear to yeah. for the funeral and stuff um I and I was just I didn't know anyone there yet either because I hadn't made friends over there for five right. days so I didn't have anybody to even like help me and my mom was like I can send like my aunt to like drive down there I was like, there's no need for any of that. Also, I didn't really want to be around anybody. Yeah. I felt like uncomfortable. I was so sad and 
I don't know. I'm, I'm like weird and sappy stuff. Like I'm not a hugger or like stuff yeah. like that. And so I just kind of wanted to deal with it just sitting there. I just wanted to teleport. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I got on a plane and got there eventually. Um, but yeah, no, I was not expecting it yeah. <laughs> at all. So she was in a detox center mm -hmm. and she passed away. Can you kind of tell a little bit about what happened and what you ended up finding out had happened? Mm -hmm. It's so crazy. Um, she was in a detox center and I guess she was getting kicked out because she was using in it, which I don't even know how that works. Like, how <laughs> I don't know because yeah. I can't talk to her. But um, so they were kicking her out. They put her in a lift. Like they ordered her a lift to a different one. So they put her in a lift and she passed away in the lift. And, and the lift when driver put like, her didn't in? speak like very well English. So I don't think knew what was happening. But when he got to the destination, I guess she just wouldn't get out of the car. Mm -hmm. And so when the people came out from the detox center and opened the door, that's when they saw she was not responsive and I guess she right. was already they tried CPR and all this stuff and she was already gone so I don't know how long or any of that but then so what I had to do because I'm like why can't I get this story I had to reach out to other people that I knew were at that detox center I got their numbers and was like getting everybody's story everybody was really helpful and helped me I didn't know any of these people I was talking to or right. you know I just had to like go FBI because my mom hired a private investigator but nothing was happening and so I just got all these stories and some people were like I don't know why they put her in the car with her lips blue like her lips were blue before she left so they knew she was overdosing or on her or way like, to overdosing as a detox center even though you're kicking her out like you should take her to the hospital send someone with her why would someone. you put her in there alone and like just send her in the lift yeah it's all weird and nothing really adds up I don't know but it was a lot of my mom still like always wanting to get the full story but kind right. of my dad being more so like she's gone like there's nothing you can do like even private investigators and stuff they're like it's an overdose like they don't really care they even tell told my mom that they're like it's just it's very common here like as sad yeah. as that is there's not really anything to investigate like yeah all this stuff and so I got the private investigator we sent, asked him to send her phone back to us because mm -hmm. he was like, not, I can't get in it. And I'm like, give me a second. Finally, I get her phone. I unlock, I get in her iCloud. I get into everything. I'm able to find like the guy's number of who she last bought stuff from and all this stuff. And I've done, and I did way more than my mom paid, you know? Yeah, you were but determined. Just, nobody really cared, which yeah. I guess like whatever, I get it. But yeah, I all that. <laughs> investigation yeah. I tried to do it really didn't get us anywhere it's not like we're gonna like take anyone to court or anything because it's just not worth it but I think that probably my sister was able to get away with it at the one she was at so that's probably why yeah. I don't know the people I talked to they all told me that after that happened like a bunch of them left from what I was told there I don't think anybody like checked her bags or anything mm -hmm. so I think that she got like after she got caught I think she got like one last high she wanted to get one last high which i'm like she shouldn't have even had that they shouldn't have let her like how did she even with that. access that so just to think she's going to detox in her mind she's like okay because that's what she would like do if she knew she was about to go away she's like well i'm gonna get high one more time before right. i go check myself in mm -hmm. which in my head i'd be like why but i was like okay you know there's nothing i can do but so it's just sad because i know that that was like what she was thinking in her mind like i know she didn't plan on not waking up or anything she was never suicidal she never even when she was in pain she never like didn't want to be alive right like she, she wanted to get better yeah she really so wanted badly to get better. so that's also what sucks and like i hate that for her i hate that i feel sorry for like the future that she's not gonna have because it's sad and like yeah. now i'm older than her i've outgrown her which is so weird like I yeah. never, it will never not be weird to me. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you for sharing. I really do appreciate it. How has your mental health been since she passed? I struggled a lot with the grieving, like a ton. And I was, you know, doing social media before. So I kind of documented that whole, like people saw that whole thing. Yeah. Like, I woke up one morning to film a daily vlog. And that's why, because some people were like, why does she have footage from the day that she got the phone call? And I'm like, because that day I woke up and thought I was documenting my day, Your first day. day at a new job. And I still didn't even like put that stuff together until like a month later. But mm -hmm. yeah, the grief was like really took a toll on me um, very, very badly also because I didn't have anyone in my life who's kind of experienced the same type of grief, like sibling. I always was trying to be there for my mom and dad, but I was like, who's there for me yeah. type of thing. So yeah, that was all really hard but in a way it's like I've stepped up and I feel like I've like 
been stronger than I thought that I would be. Right. Which is so weird. I don't know why, but I think I, unless I'm just in denial, which I might be, <laughs> but I think that I'm handling stuff like a lot better. It's just a testament to who you are and the strength that you have. And it seems like you are a very well-rounded, well-spoken and I'm well strong spoken. person. Yeah. I think you're very well-spoken. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you kind of talked after you lost Kat and, you know, during that experience, you had started using social media and now you have a huge platform. You have 3.2 million followers on TikTok. You've used your platform to spread awareness about addiction. You've been very open about your grieving process and you also are just open about your daily life. You do daily vlogs and just let people know, you know, a day in the life is you. Why do you feel like it was so important for you to be so open to your followers? just because it was like, I, you know, I can't ever put on a front. Like I just kind of say how I'm feeling and Mm -hmm. shared, you know, if I went MIA for a month, I'm okay. I just literally am not okay, (laughs) which is, yeah, (laughs) I'm okay, but I'm not. Yeah. And I, I don't know. It was just really nice. Like being able to have so many people that just like reached out and could relate and stuff and, and enjoyed hearing that. Mm -hmm. And like how I said that nobody in my life could really relate to losing a sibling and stuff. Well, when I post online, you know, my messages were like, they still to this day, it's just like flooded with people saying like, sorry if this is weird, but um, I lost my sister and I just don't feel like I have anyone to talk to about it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. it's not weird. <laughs> I like, we did the same it. thing. I'd reach out to somebody too, you know, who I saw posted something about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really cool. I feel like I have all these little like relatable friends and stuff online. Yeah. And- it's a world of support. Yeah. If anyone out there is struggling and you could say something to them right now and they don't know what to do, they don't know how to handle a situation, what would you tell that person? Um, I always just say, like, it's okay to feel all the things. You don't have to hold it in all the time if you feel like you have to. Sometimes I felt like I was annoying. I mean, I am annoying, but I, I, <laughs> I post so. a lot on social media. And so <laughs> I just feel like I would just go through for like a year, just every single day I just post photos of her and I'm, I'm sure people were like, weirded out or like why is this all she talks about Mm -hmm. it is the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to me so it is what consumes me I don't mean to like make it my personality but it's still so fresh and Mm -hmm. it's all you know there's not a day that I wake up and don't think about her and think about what the fuck this so this sucks so like you're not insane for feeling that way if it consumes you and it's all you want to talk about or bring up or if you're going crazy and that's normal Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, losing people sucks and it's like a universal thing, but you shouldn't have to like go through that. I feel like so young and so intensely. So yeah, just, it's okay to not be okay and feel whatever you need to feel. If you need to scream, if you need to take time off, just like be open with people and be like, Hey, I am not handling this well please bear with me. (laughs) Yeah. Because I even like, I I get like embarrassed if I think about stuff that I did like in early grief. I'm like, like I lashed out on so many people, but I'm like hearing other people's stories. I'm like, okay, so it wasn't just me. Like other people have done that too. And just like some things that I did would like, I'd get like super, you know, fucked up some nights and just like cry and do crazy stuff. I don't know. Some it's normal, more normal than we think. Yeah. It's just part of it. Um, so yeah, it's okay to feel all the feels and (laughs) <laughs> just take it day by day. Yeah, <laughs> truly. Okay, so one other question actually I want to ask you is, what is your relationship like with alcohol and other substances? Well, my sister never like drank. Mm-hmm. She wasn't a drinker at all. And drinking is like the only thing I do. Like I don't do any other, I never I'm have. The same way. Whatever. <laughs> and so, but that was kind of what she'd always hold against me. She'd be like, well, at least I don't get fucked up like you. Blah, blah, blah. It was just kind of like a lot of back yeah. and forth. Um, so yeah, sometimes I do feel like, you know, I have my own struggles with my relationship with alcohol. I don't really, I, well, I've never like drank alone and stuff like that. I don't like, yeah, whatever, but I do it socially only. I don't know. I'm, I'm very mindful of it, but yeah, <laughs> that's what I do. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So looking ahead, what are you, you know, looking forward to? Is there anything in the pipeline that you're excited to share with us that you're working on? Um, I have a ton of ideas for things and some things that are kind of being discussed right now, but nothing just some things that are being discussed. Mm -hmm. And like I said, this is like my yes year. So I'm trying to do more and push myself a lot this year. I don't know what it was. I think maybe I'm just finally at a place where I'm like, okay, I can be normal. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And I'm taking things day by day, but yeah, I feel like this is going to be a good year and 
Yeah, I guess I'll have to follow along I to love that. find out. Well, we definitely <laughs> will. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And to anyone listening who maybe is needing some help, you can always reach out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, we are here. My DMs are open. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so before we wrap, we do this thing in every episode where I have my guests pick three songs that they either really like right now or that kind of fit into the theme of the episode. So what would you say are three songs that got you through the hardest times that you've been through? You're going to make fun of me because I listen to the radio. That's fine. (laughs) But um, I love to play the saddest things and like blast it. Oh (laughs) my gosh. You can do sad songs. We love Um, sad songs. Well, okay. We played Freebird at my sister's funeral because she sent me a text requesting that like as a joke beforehand, (laughs) obviously. And I took it serious. So we played that. So Mm -hmm. I'd say Freebird. Because every time I hear it, I like if I go to bars, I'll request it. It's just like so special to me. I listen to a lot. Of, I would cry to a lot of Lauren da- Daigle. Anything sappy. <laughs> Anything. All right. We'll add some sad girl songs in there. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Christy. You are truly an inspiration. And mm. I'm really glad I got to meet you and chat with you. And I'm really grateful again for you being so vulnerable and sharing your story. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. I hope you enjoy the rest of your trip in LA. (laughs) Thank you to all my listeners. We'll be back next week with another exciting episode. And yeah, thanks for listening to trying to figure it out. Bye.